I'm really sorry, but I'm going to talk to you today about one of the worst topics in the world. Business meetings. I hate business meetings. They're boring, they're inefficient, they're empty talk most of the time. Have you noticed the way people talk during meetings? Some of the people present are pretty normal during the rest of the day, but once they're next to you in a meeting, you don't understand the word they're saying. They're pushing the envelope. They're practicing blue sky thinking. They're even moving the goalposts. What goalposts? What is that all about? On Twitter, I saw somebody had printed winners' awards ribbons, blue with gold lettering embossed, saying, I survived another meeting that should have been an email. I love those. Because have you noticed how everything at work always have to, has to be about efficiency, about money? And how this line of thinking comes to a full stop once people are in a meeting? I mean, take the average meeting at your office. Multiply the duration of the meeting by the number of people present, and multiply that by the average hourly wages of the people present. That one meeting could easily cost the company thousands of euros, and nobody's talking about it. Instead, if the meeting doesn't solve their problem, which meetings rarely do, the managers will happily call for a follow-up meeting. Because managers love meetings. They say, we, they, we need meetings to exchange information, to make decisions, or to do a brainstorm. But a meeting is actually the worst place in the world to exchange information or to do a brainstorm. For in a large group, people will all have to wait for each other to be able to say something. And in doing so, they are killing each other's stream of creative ideas. There's ample scientific proof for that, which nobody ever uses. Do you know what a meeting is? It's not a game. It may have goalposts, moving goalposts even, but no, it's not a game. It's a ritual. In fact, it's not so very different from a funeral service. <laughs> Meetings kill, they do, especially the useless and boring ones. First, they kill your freedom. Then they kill your creativity. Next, they kill your will to live. <laughs> and in the end, they will kill you. There is research backing this up. Where would we be without research? Research shows that sitting is really bad for people. It's literally killing us. If you're in a meeting, it's killing you on so many levels, it's pretty much collective suicide. Now, you could say there's standing meetings. Yes, there are. But there's not many of them. And let's be honest, why do people hold standing meetings? Because they're quicker. And why are they quicker? Because people will want to sit down again. If you're one of those people holding standing meetings, you will also die. Am I joking? Sure, <laughs> I'm always joking. But this time, I'm not just joking. A couple of years ago, I started collecting scientific research to prove that business meetings are evil. I did that for a book I wrote. It was my way of offering victim support to people who have to suffer too many meetings. And don't we all? The research I looked for wasn't hard to find. There are so many sound arguments against holding work meetings. I'll give you some examples. Diffusion of responsibility is one. In a big group of people, nobody feels responsible for what's happening. It's the same as in what psychologists call the bystander effect, like somebody gets a heart attack in the street and falls down, and nobody does anything, because everybody thinks, if it's really so bad, another person would come to the rescue. In fact, a meeting is exactly like such an emergency, except everybody is sitting down. And what is the emergency? Well, it might be that guy who won't stop talking. We all know that guy, right? We all fear him. He's the guy who makes people miss their trains. And the thing is, 
People tend to think this guy is the expert on whatever it is he is going on about, but he isn't. He's an expert at something else, talking. Research shows that people who talk the longest in meetings are the ones who systematically overestimate what they know. If they are given a list of words, and they have to circle the words they know the meaning of, they even circle the nonsense terms that the researchers have shrewdly hidden among the words in the list. So we're listening to a guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. Or are we? Are we listening? Probably not. If a meeting goes on forever, as they tend to do, it's very hard to keep focused. A meeting is a place where you have to keep your emotions in check. You can't say career-killing things out loud. You can't show that actually you'd prefer to be somewhere else. You can't drop your pants at your boss and say, this is my opinion about that. You cannot do that. And all that requires self-control to an extent that's emotionally very exhausting. Psychologists call this type of exhaustion ego depletion. And in such a state, people tend to give in to temptations. You can't see it, of course, they don't show it. But in a meeting, several of your colleagues are probably thinking about sex. It might even be sex with you. <laughs> Next time you're in a meeting, someone's just staring at you, now you know what they're thinking. <laughs> so, there we are, in a sitting emergency of people who do not feel responsible, who are not listening, who are thinking about sex. And then this is what happens. People start stealing each other's ideas. It's called cryptomnesia, and this is how it works. Even when people are not listening to each other, their brains do, to some extent, record what, what is being said, but not by whom. So one moment, you're stating a brilliant idea, and nobody reacts, because nobody's listening. And half an hour later, some other guy offers this same idea and sells it as if it's his idea. We all still know that guy, right? And nobody notices he's just stolen your idea, because nobody was paying attention when you said it. And when it popped up in the brain of the other guy, he just thought it came about by the workings of his own brilliant brain. So, I have to stress that I've only looked for arguments against work meetings. There might be arguments in favor of work meetings, but I haven't come across them. And if I would, you would certainly not hear them from me. What I do know is that piles and piles of books have been written about how to make meetings better, more efficient, more fun even. And has anybody ever noticed any effects of any of those top-selling books? Because I haven't. And another thing, a weird thing, I've got at least two friends who say they like to go to meetings. I know. I like my friends to be a bit crazy. But to them, I always say that they would like it even better if they would restrain themselves, cut down on it a bit. And in fact, there's research backing that up as well. And all major world religions seem to know it too, with their bans on certain types of food and, food and sex in certain circumstances. Only the religion of business meetings somehow hasn't grasped that fact. And it is a religion, holding work meetings. It has gurus who talk and teach the weird language of business meetings to insecure managers, who then start pushing envelopes and move goalposts and believe with all their hearts that meetings are good, which they're not. Meetings are pure evil. Meetings are a religion in which people can't stop talking, talking in weird tongues, 
to people who do not feel responsible for anything, who do not listen, and who steal each other's ideas while they're thinking about sex. Probably sex with you. Now, if that doesn't sound pretty much like an evil satanic orgy. And that's exactly what business meetings are. Meetings are evil. And the thing is, we have to kill them. Before they kill our freedom, before they kill our creativity, before they kill our will to live, and before they kill us. Thank you for listening. <laughs>